Okay, um, this is going to be really quick, hopefully. Um, so I'm going to start off with, I'm not going to, actually, I usually start this with what is a pear scylla? Um, how is that affecting the pear industry? But I think a lot of people already know that, so I'm going to skip that. Um, but I will start with insects can communicate in different ways. So we've seen that the use of pheromones as a, as a communication system has been really useful in um, coddle, coddling moth. Um, I keep wanting to say cuddle moan, which is the, the pheromone. Um, but yeah, so insects can communicate in different ways. They can communicate through pheromones or visual cues. But what I'm interested in is it's vibrational communication or what we call biotermology. And this communication system is very ubiquitous in insects. So recently, um, an interest in this fascinating communication system created a surge of foundational research or what people would call basic research, but I like to call it foundational research. And that we've learned that most by, um, hemipterans use vibrations to communicate. And one of those hemipterans is Pearsilla. And so this is a perfect system to try out this new type of mating disruption. So we know that Pearsilla is a major pest in the pear industry because of their pesky ability in developing pesticide resistance. And that's because they have multiple generations per year. I'm not going to go over the difference between summer form and winter forms because y'all know that. But pear psylla actually follows a similar mating behavior to most psyllid species. So males will produce an advertising call to attract females. And if females like and are receptive to that male, they, were, they will um, also create their own song. And then this results in a duet. So they keep doing this until the male will find a female and they copulate. And kind of like Marco Polo, so the males will sing, females will call, and then the males will like crawl towards the direction. And then that keeps going on and on. And as I said, they use vibrational communication, which means that um, we can't hear them. So we don't know whether or not they're calling. Um, this means that they're sending bending waves through the stem and the leaves. And they detect these vibrations with mechanosensors on their legs and their bodies. And so this is the male song. Hopefully it works. And as you can see, that goes on for like 10 more seconds. So we don't need to hear the rest of that. And then the females, um, so they kind of go in that, that pattern, right? And then the females kind of sound less interesting. And they don't actually move the branches that hard. This is just for animation. And so this duetting behavior is a great candidate for exploitation for the use of mating disruption. But there isn't a lot of research on using vibration as a pest management strategy yet because the technology and the idea is relatively new. I wouldn't say the idea is new, but the discovery of the idea is new. Um, but there is a study on leafhoppers on grapes um, that has been going on for five years now. And they're seeing um, good results by uh, using these vibrational devices on trellis. And so they're just sending the vibrations through the wires on the grapes. And they're, um, they're just sending a uh, pure tone. Let me see. I don't think I have that. All right. But additionally, in my previous experiments, um, using white noise as a mating disruption in a greenhouse, I saw that vibrational playback, uh, the white noise vibrational playback was effective for both the um, summer forms and the winter forms. But the male song isn't as effective on the winter forms, but that might be because I was using a summer form call. So they have distinct um, frequency and I think similar patterns, but the, the sound is different for the summer form, the winter form. And so my question is, can we apply this to the orchards, right? Because I've been doing it in the greenhouse for a while. And so I think it's, it was time to move on to like a early phase trial in the orchard. And so my hypothesis would be, you know, using vibrational communication, um, playbacks will disrupt their mating behavior by flooding their acoustic environment with a lot of noise. And that'll 
hopefully reduce the number of offspring of the next generation because then they can't find each other to mate. So to test this hypothesis, I set up about 40 plants in the Wenatchee Tree Fruit and Research and Extension Center for the winter forms. Um, I just call it tree freck for some reason, and I can never say the full name. And then I set up the summer forms in the Sunrise Orchard. And so for each trial, as I said, 10 trees per treatment. I did four treatments actually, but the negative control I'm not counting. So this is just a control, which is uh, no playback and then the male songs. And this time I did use the winter form song for the winter forms and then the summer form song for the summer forms. And then white noise. And then to apply those playbacks, I used an MP3 player um, plugged into a power bank so that they can play continuously. And then I put them in a Ziploc to waterproof them. Very high tech. Um, and, then, and then I cleaned out um, a, a stem to make sure that there's no, any, uh, there's no scylla on eggs, nims or adults on it. Then I wrap it in paint strainer to exclude it from the environment and then um, attach the vibrational device to it. Oh, and I added five females and three males, kind of like a mating arena, just like their own thing. But so no one else, no one else can come in there and disturb them. Um, and then I put in this vibrational playback device that I made using um, linear resonance actuators, which are actually what makes your phones vibrate. So they're pretty cheap. Um, so they mimic the vibrations that the Scylla can produce. And so I can actually play back the male song and the Scylla will detect it as a, a song from the Scylla. So here's a close up of that really high tech setup. And then I continually played it for two weeks. Um, and then for the winter forms, I only counted the eggs. For the summer forms, I counted the eggs and the nymphs and then the adults. The winter forms have slower development because of the cold. So we can only see eggs at that time. And so let's look at some results. So the x-axis is the playback treatments, the control, male song, and then a white noise. And then on the y-axis are the number of eggs for this particular experiment is for the winter form. So there's only eggs. So what I saw is that on average, white noise had a lower um, number of eggs compared to the control. So it doesn't, it looks like it's not significant, which is, it isn't, but it looks like it's trending in our favor. So I think more replicates would be needed um, for this experiment. And then for the summer forms, I just switched out the Y axis to total offspring instead of just eggs. So that's eggs, nymphs, and adults that I can find in the bag. And here, um, I was a bit baffled because really you can see that the control had the least number of offspring, which is a bit weird. Um, and, but then I looked at this and I consulted the wise Paracilla expert, Robert Orpet. I mean, Dr. Robert Orpet. And, <laughs> and um, we talked about how Andrew is more susceptible to Paracilla. So I kind of just separated my data into these two cultivars and I saw that um, you can see it on your handout that uh, two of those controls had is the one that's driving that data up um, for uh, Andrew. So I think that it looks like it, it's very, very promising. And I think that it's it has an effect on the Andrew cultivar, but not in the Bartlett. So I don't know. We don't know. But it, it, it looks cool. Uh, so this means that it may be possible to exploit, uh, exploit paracilla vibrational communication as a potential mating disruption tool. But mechanisms on this um, could be that you're just flooding their acoustic environment with noise so they can't hear each other. But that also means that females are settling for those males that are nearby. So it could be low quality sperm because you're just settling for your neighbor. Um, <laughs> but uh, that could also mean that if they're trying to really look for those optimal mates, they could be delaying their mating and then the egg delaying their egg laying so they could have less eggs that they could lay. And so white noise contains uh, different frequencies. So even with um, differing individual songs, it could cover the, the songs kind of like anti-noise, right? So, um, so some frequencies can be masked. But then also temperatures could be an important factor because temperature can affect how songs are produced. Sort of like you have to warm up your voice when you wanna sing a higher pitch. So at higher temperatures, their frequencies are 
higher. And then at low temperatures, they can't move their body as much. So they can only produce a, mi a minute amount of vibration. So that creates a lower frequency song. So also, they could also be perceived differently because of the water content in the stems. And so I don't know about this yet. This is just, I just looked at this data and this is a really early phase um, trial in the orchards, but there could be differences in Andrew and Bartlett that the pear Scylla is homing on. Maybe they like Andrew for egg laying. Maybe they have better nutrition and better egg laying spaces than Bartlett. We don't know, maybe. So more replications with intentional variety treatment um, with, <laughs> I found this in the internets, um, with Dr. Orpet, hopefully as a postdoc. Um, and then we are also currently writing grants to fund a project on using trellis wires in trellis pairs to deliver that vibration to multiple trees. So the, the, my problem with this project or like the thing that I've been dreading the most since I started this project is how logistically we can apply this to orchards. So this might be a way, and no, so this picture is what they, um, the company has, a company has created this vibrational tool um, playback with solar panels so that they could be powered by the sun. Um, and then we can also look at other behaviors that may be affected um, by these acoustic playbacks, such as are they being deterred by feeding it or are they being deterred from laying um, those eggs on the stems that are vibrating. So yeah, and with that, I'd like to thank my committee, my partner in crime, the multiple undergrads that have helped 